to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Hello and welcome to our book club. I'm Minnie Menon and today we're putting uh, the spotlight on the Maratha century, a period which saw the rise of the Marathas uh, and uh, their influence all the way from Katak to Atak, from Kumaon to the Kaveri. Joining us uh, for this discussion is uh, Dr. Uday Kulkarni, who's just uh, released his book, The Maratha Century. He's, of course, been the author of a series of book, books on the Marathas, from the Solaces at Panipat to the Bhakkar of Panipat, which was a translation, the era of Baji Rao, the extraordinary epic of Nana Sahib Peshwa, and the Maratha Century really brings together a lot of his research and fresh research that he has done uh, to explain the century, actually more than a century that the Maratha has dominated. So Dr. Kulkarni, great to have you on the show. And as I was saying, it really brings together all of uh, the work, but what amazes me of course is, and you have clarified that uh, the Maratha century is more figurative than actual because you know, you've taken it from the rise of Chhatrapati Shivaji uh, to the resurrection under Madhav Rao the first. And I would argue it goes far beyond that as well, because it also goes to the states of Baroda, Gwalior, etc., which yes. played such an important role in, in the turn of the uh, 21st century as 20th century as well. So I'm going to start by asking you, um, what do you think marked this Maratha century? And why do you think, you know, uh, why do you feel that because the focus has been more on how the British began expanding into India after the Battle of Plassey, that this part of India's history uh, hasn't been given its due? Okay, thanks a lot for having me on Live History. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. <clears throat> and as I see it, you're starting from the end of the book. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to give the conclusion first. And uh, actually, I have always been kind of uh, disturbed by the slight imbalance we have in our narratives, whether it's historical, whether it's what we see in the newspapers and so on. So I have actually got into this to set the narrative right. And I always felt that this uh, business about what the people usually feel that the British Empire started in 1757 and they took over from the Mughals and there's nothing in between. Which I feel was a, which is which I feel is an imbalance. I mean, in the very early part of the 19th century, if you see the early histories that were written by the British, they very sincerely acknowledged that we, after all, took this over from the Marathas. And as time went by, uh, it was kind of forgotten because in 1857 there was a, a war and there was an uprising against the British, and uh, finally the focus of that was the capture of Delhi. And I feel that in a certain way has percolated into the general uh, consciousness that the British uh, and, the, and the Queen actually took over uh, the, uh, from the company and took over the country from the Mughals. And of course, it is the narrative which has been given in our books because I still feel that we kind of learn a Delhi-centric history. And uh, while Indian history is multifocal, you have to stand at various vantage points. It's a regional history. And very rarely you find one empire. Uh, at any rate, no empire has actually captured the entire subcontinent of India. Okay. They captured the entire subcontinent of India for more than a decade or two. Uh, they've either been a North Indian empire or they've been a South Indian empire. But very rarely you find that the entire country was under one rule. That's why I say it's a multifocal uh, history which we have to appreciate and we have to tell it from various vantage points you can't just say i will speak from the maratha point of view you have to talk of bengal you have to talk of the karnatic you have to talk of delhi you have to talk of the punjab so this is how you have to bring it all together and i aim to bring it all together in a manner that a person when i'm describing something that's happening in Pune, people know the readers know at that point point in time, what was happening in Bengal or the Karnataka? Because they are, there's an interplay of all the things that are happening at the same time. I don't believe in this uh, breaking up history into 1750 to 1760, the Punjab. 1750 to 1760, the uh, Bengal. I mean, this doesn't allow the reader to get a complete view 
what actually was happening at that point in time mm. so that is why i am bringing it down to smaller and smaller periods so that i can cover the entire country's history from a multiple point of view uh, having said that it is impossible to actually read about indian history without learning about the maratha history in the 18th century because there was no region of india which they did not touch and unless you know maratha history and unfortunately most of the people who have written about maratha history have not access marathi documents because they were never translated how many of the historians who have written these books and really have taken the pains to read those letters i mean a person like sarkar who laid his entire history on persian sources and who dismiss uh, marathi sources out of hand i mean other day in the fall of the mughal empire i read one statement which was startling he said that uh, i dismiss nana fadness's autobiography out of hand because he wrote it 30 years later the fact of the matter is he wrote it within a few months of returning from panipat and the story ends there he no, never continued that autobiography after that because right. in the last page of the autobiography he describes i have written it in this book also he describes the journey after madhavrao is given the robes of the office of peshwa by the chatrapati he describes mm-hmm. the journey back from satara to pune in details so that is when the story ended so this right. kind of bias okay so this is interesting but you know technically the marathas were never one empire right and I, let's look at it in three phases and i really want you to talk about it because there are two aspects of it that i find very interesting the first is that you divide the maratha century actually and you one should into three phases you have the first phase which is the rise of chhatrapati shivaji and uh, the idea of a swaraj that kind of inspires everything and continues to inspire politics today because he's so larger than life then you have the bajirao era which actually sees the coming in of a fresh blood of merit merit based uh, generals who actually lead the foray and take it all the way to attack right where the maratha influence is so strong and the third phase is the resurrection after the battle of panipat uh, which uh, is under madhavrao the first but also it stays beyond that with baroda and you know the um, uh, sayaji rao gaikwad played such a fabulous role in, in the shaping of modern india in that context so uh, why do you think uh, chatrapati shivaji played such an important role in inspiring all of them because under him it wasn't as if the maratha empire was at the greatest i mean that happened later or the maratha influence was the greatest what do you think uh, made him so large than life actually uh, <clears throat> there's a this small uh, this, the beginning is the most important part of any work that's what people say and the foundation or the of the pyramid which came up later that was laid by him and if you see the opponents that he had at that point in time the opposition that he was playing against that opposition was much much stronger than what anybody else encountered in the 18th or the 19th centuries he had the mughal empire at its peak the most powerful when aurangzeb came down to the deccan that was of course after his death or even when the bijapur uh, uh, adil shahi and qutub shahi were in south of him imagine a small place with just a district probably just the district of pune and a few places around it which mm-hmm. were his ancestral jagir sandwich between the moguls coming from the north emperor akbar had captured uh, ahmednagar in 1599 and the pressure from the south with bijapur and you find this small district sandwich in the middle and from there you find he takes off he has the uh, the kind of fortitude the courage the guile uh, combining all these attributes he establishes a kingdom which extends right up to the kaveri mm. i mean the fort of jinji was repaired expanded and uh, set up by him look at his vision when he sets up the maratha navy how many rulers of western india or probably how many rulers except sir rajendra chola have really had the vision and the wherewithal to actually set up a proper navy a functioning navy which made a difference so there are many reasons and it is not as if his vision was lost because uh, there is a statement in marathi attributable to chatrapati shivaji in fact baba sahib purandare has said it in one of his talks that sindhu cha uguma pasun means the from the origin of the river sindhu till the kaveri across the uh, banks of the kaveri augha muluk apla this entire territory is ours and in mahakshetra zone sodwavi 
go and liberate all the principal places the principal temples which are under mogol occupation so this is the vision he gave at that point in time and you find the in this book i published the will of madhavrao peshwa which was more than 100 years later in the 10 points that he mentions one of them is that go and liberate the places of kashi and uh, prayag give something to the nawab of our the required and take it from offer him the wazir's position that's what nana sahib had said so that vision of liberating the mahakshetra of this entire country being one part so when raghunath rao goes to lahore and is approached by the shah of iran that uh, why don't you come from that side i'll come from here and we'll squeeze abdali in the middle so he writes to the peshwa that why should we give away kandahar and kabul which were part of the indian empire just about 100 years back so that vision was there and it remained for much of the 18th century rather than dividing this into three different parts i would look upon it as a continuum of course there were setbacks and there were reasons for those setbacks but the chatrapati shivaji was always considered and will be continue to be considered as the greatest of all i mean his genius was never repeated in the annals of maratha history i say that and that is because of the opposition he had to encounter in his time and he overcame that opposition that is another significant part of his story so i don't write so much about the 17th century because so much has already been written about it but uh, there's no denying the fact that his role is the pivotal role in the entire story 